Pacifism, the science of peace, and the constitution of war as a governance problem. Joanna Rodley Horno at Global Studies Quarterly, Volume 4, Issue 3, July 2024, published the 27th of August 2024. Abstract conflict prevention is a core item on the agenda of major international organizations and fora. In this article, I trace how war became a problem accessible to international governance, adopting an object-centered approach to international relations, OIR. I argue that war's constitution as a problem of international governance unfolded in three interrelated processes. Firstly, pacifists and philanthropists designated war as a scientific object, thus giving rise to a science of peace. Secondly, scholars and pacifists compiled statistics on war thus translating it across contexts and representing it as a global phenomenon. Statistics help to make war accessible to advocacy and policyholders as an object of expertise. Totally, peace advocates problematized war as a governance object by representing it as a cost-benefit problem and a major cause in the reversal of economic development. By tracing the historical development of war as an epistemic object that can be investigated systematically, an object of expertise that can be measured and compared, and an object of governance that can be manipulated. This article bridges the strands of OIR that have previously only focused on either knowledge and expertise or governance. Further, it adds to peace and conflict scholarship by providing an intellectual history of the prevention idea and its entanglement with modernism. Finally, it advances broader IR scholarship by offering an analysis of the role of scientific developments and non-state activism in producing ideas and enabling policy agendas. Introduction How did war become preventable? Prussian military officers like General Friedrich von Bernhardi or Field Marshal Helmut van Moltke the Elder, for example, understood war to be not only an essential part of human nature, but as a means to achieve glory, military strength, and social progress. Huser 2022, pages 128-9. In addition to its immaterial benefit, so the argument goes, war brings material benefits in the form of the production of supplies and armaments, as well as the increase of various services in the conduct of war, cf. Wright 1942, 281. For imperialists across the globe and through the centuries, war is a means to expand national territory and acquire resources, which supposedly helps to solve problems of overpopulation, shortage of raw materials and foodstuffs, and industrial depression right 1936-1942, pages 282-3, see also Angel 1936.1 yet today, numerous actors in international politics subscribe to the belief that war can and should be prevented. War is now fundamentally a problem of international concern, and conflict prevention is a core goal for numerous international organizations, IOs, commissions, International Non-Governmental Organizations, IMOs, and International Fora, LUM 2008, 287. As some argue, this widespread conviction indicates that the notion of war as profitable was slowly, albeit certainly not entirely, displaced over the 19th and 20th centuries, right 1942, pages 281 to 3, Muller 1989, 27 8 while the historical processes crystallizing the idea that war can and should be prevented are multiple, and unfolded over the course of centuries. I shed light on a previously underappreciated mechanism that facilitated the governance of war in its current form within the international conflict prevention agenda. A heterogeneous set of actors comprising pacifists, philanthropists, scientists, and organizations constructed war as an object of expertise and, in further consequence, as a distinct problem of international governance. This process of problem constitution produced war as an object that is undesirable but knowable and calculable, and therefore governable. I argue that this problem conception of war, and the appeal to the authority of scientific evidence and statistical measurement within it, was wielded by pacifists to reject the notion that war is desirable and profitable, and in this way ultimately entrenched prevention as the ideal course of action. Drawing on archival documents, including historical pamphlets, studies, resolutions, and reports, I explain how war became a problem accessible to international governance against specific rationalities.
focusing on the constitution of war as a measurable object of scientific investigation, expertise, and governance. Tracing the emergence of governance objects sheds light on the underlying conceptions that make certain policies appear feasible, intuitive, legitimate, and desirable while marginalizing others. The construction of war as an international problem orients policy by representing prevention as the ideal response. As I outline below, scholarship investigating efforts at banishing war from inter-entity relations and transforming it into peaceful conflict resolution abounds. Consequently, much of the following historical narrative might be well known to scholars of European and US peace movements. However, I contextualize it in a novel way through the lens of object constitution. Bracketing debates about the causes of war, I examine how a specific conception of war as preventable became accessible to international governance and facilitated the emergence of a particular policy agenda. That is, I shift the focus from the premise that war is a problem to questioning how it is rendered a problem that can be addressed by today's bureaucratic international governance that purports to mobilize scientific insights for evidence-based policy interventions, for example, Mary 2016, Zap 2022. The contribution of this article is threefold. Firstly, it expands the scholarship on objects in international relations, IR, that scrutinizes socio-material politics of knowledge production and its implications for global governance, Esquera 2024. This forum, see also Eridor 2010, Madsen 2011, Cory 2013, Buja 2015, Sending 2015, Allen 2017, 2018 A, Esquera 2019, Abraham 2022. By tracing the historical development of war as an epistemic object that can be investigated systematically, an object. Finally, it advances broader IR scholarship by offering an analysis of the role of scientific developments, and non-state activism in producing the widely taken for granted idea that war is a governance problem that can be addressed scientifically. In the next section, I outline the theoretical framework of this piece concerning the elements of problem constitution and their resulting objects. The subsequent empirical part begins with a brief sketch of the historical development of efforts at replacing war with peaceful relations. It then traces the constitution of war as a triple object of science expertise, and governance, through the stages of problem constitution. The article concludes with a summary of the argument and a brief outlook on further research. The constitution of war as a triple object existing research on prevention usually assumes that war is a problem of international politics. It typically begins the narrative with United Nations, UN, Secretary General Dag Hammarskjöld's efforts at preventive diplomacy during the Cold War or, even more often, with UN Secretary General Boutros Boutros Ghali's 1992 Report on Agenda for Peace, Lund 1996, Zartman 2001, Agestum 2003, Carnant and Schnappel 2003, Call and Campbell 2018, Ramcharan and Ramcharan 2020. While some acknowledge that prevention is not a novel idea, in the 20th century Ackerman 2003, Melander and Pagach 2007, Lund 2008. This literature remains focused on how war entered the international agenda, but does not ask how it became a problem to be governed internationally in the first place. A rich body of works tracing the genealogy of war and efforts to banish it exists. For example, Settle 1996, Howard 2000, Arthur de Ocono 2011, Bartleson 2018, Hughes are 2022, but its historical insights are usually not extended to current day governance of war in the form of international conflict prevention policy. Additionally, a rich literature drawing on post-structuralist thought examines discourses on war's manifestations, uses, and interpretations. For example, Dylan and Reed 2001, Jabri 2007, Bousquet 2009, Zephyrus 2018, However, these works are also not focused on explaining how war became construed as a governable, and specifically preventable, problem of international politics. A notable exception is Andrew, 2022, who analyzes the logics underlying the construction of war as a problem of deviance, 
although this work also does not extend to explaining how this problematization facilitates and shapes international policy, past or current. In this article, I conceptualize war as a triple object. Firstly, as a scientific object, war becomes a recognizable entity amenable to scientific investigation. As an object of expertise, the notion of war as undesirable but measurable and calculable provides policymakers with the categories, objects, and devices they mobilize for governing. Esquera 2024, this forum, in this way, it shapes the type of problem war becomes and in his specific options for governing. As an object of governance, sending 2015, Allen 2018a, this conception of war provides a focal point to orient actors, organizes their interactions in international politics, and thus eventually structures order and governance. Esquera 2024, this forum, put simply, the constitution of problems through these objects has concrete policy consequences, as it defines what the problem is, and how and why it has to be solved. To draw out how the conception of war as a measurable and calculable problem facilitated the emergence of conflict prevention as a policy goal. I leverage Allen's 2017 framework of problem constitution. It consists of three processes, designation, translation, and problematization, that can heuristically be conceived as stages but may occur simultaneously and recurrently. Below. I explain how each of these processes applies to the problem of war and its prevention, and how these stages relate to the three types of objects. That is, while others show how different, even competing, objects of expertise shape the constitution of a governance problem, for example, Pantaleon 2024, this forum, I trace here how one issue manifests as multiple objects simultaneously to produce a governance problem. Firstly, before becoming a governance problem, an object needs to be rendered recognizable through the observation and classification of natural and social phenomena. Allen 2017, 137. This process of producing a distinct and contained entity is what Allen 2017, 137, calls designation. For example, battles are social phenomena that can be observed and classified along categories such as incidence and magnitude which characterized the entity war, Barcordi 2016, Cusa 2022, 30. Designation depends on a knowledge-based group to reproduce the object within the shared discursive frame, confirming its central characteristics, governability, and relevance to actors' interests. Cori 2013, 87. In the case of conflict prevention, this knowledge-based group comprised philanthropists, scientists, and pacifists, who claimed that war can be addressed through the generation and dissemination of scientific knowledge. Andrew 2022, 706. In other words, this group designated war as a scientific object, although often understood as being at the center of a research process. Scientific objects do not need to be embedded within academic or disciplinary infrastructures, CF, nor set in a 2001, 181. As I demonstrate below, they can be the product of activist knowledge production. Thus, I expand Allen's 2017 framework by showing how non-state actors such as pacifists and philanthropists, who are not experts or professionals in a scientific sense, are not only involved in the formulation of the object as a problem, but also in its designation as a distinct entity. However, science is not expertise in itself. It turns into expertise where it is made authoritative in relation to a problem. Leander and Wilver 2018, 2 and 3. To become an object of expertise, knowledge about war requires an authoritative interpretation. See also Esquera 2024. This forum, Litos Monet 2024. This forum, as I argue below, the peace philanthropy of the early 20th century established this claim to authority through the appeal to the scientific method as well as the professionalization of the science of peace. Furthermore, the central role of science in the making of war as an object of expertise is by no means exclusive to pacifist efforts. Indeed, war and science have existed in symbiosis since the ascendancy of the scientific worldview in the 17th and 18th centuries to the present day. Bousquet 2009 3. Scientific concepts and theories have informed military thought on the nature of combat. 
military organization, and strategy development for centuries, as the goal of military innovation has facilitated a range of scientific insights and developments, from the atomic bomb to climate science, Bousquet 2009, Hope 2015, Allen 2017. Thus, while I acknowledge that competing objects of expertise and governance exist that may constitute war differently, I focus here on one specific conception, and how it constitutes the intellectual foundation for the international prevention agenda. Secondly, translation is the process of making the object legible to different policy audiences and publics across state contexts, i.e., making it international, by converting it into a portable entity. Representations as formalized measures, standardized codes, and terminologies help to reproduce an object of expertise in meaningful ways beyond its original context. Allen 2017, pages 137 to 8. I argue that quantification is a way of translating war, as military budgets, casualty counts, and war debts enable comparisons of war across historical and geographical contexts. The early scientific studies that compile quantitative evidence work to define war as a measurable phenomenon and, in this way, enable the calculation and comparison of the losses and expenses resulting from war. Finally, governance objects are those entities that can be designated, that is, that are considered meaningful and recognizable, are malleable, that is, that can be rendered governable, and are politically salient, that is, that relate to identities and interests, Corrie 2013, 87, problematization, then, is the process of making the object relevant to actors by connecting it to existing discourses of threats, identities, interests, and policy frames. Entities that are not constituted in this way may instead become issues of domestic policy or non-problems of mere scientific or social interest. Allen 2017, 137, 8, put simply, while designation constructs the object as a distinct epistemic entity and translation renders it recognizable across contexts, problematization specifies what kind of problem it is for whom, before a policy agenda can emerge, experts and activists need to persuade policymakers and publics that the problem at hand deserves their scarce resources and attention. Problematization thus emphasizes that a problem both can and should be governed, as I show below. The problematization of war in the sphere of IOs and IMOs builds on cost-benefit reasoning, which asserts that preventing war is more cost-effective than post-conflict reconstruction. From the 19th century onward, when the concepts of improvement, development, and growth were introduced and institutionalized within the sphere of international governance as central state purposes Allen 2018 b. War turns into a problem as cost-benefit analyses make visible how it undermines these objectives. Prevention thus emerges not only as a feasible but also as the preferable option for managing the problem of war. The making of the modern prevention idea a prominent premise in historical scholarship on European political development is that war was considered a historical necessity and the default state of politics for centuries. Muller 1990, 321. Settle 1996, 1, Holstein 1998, Coca 2010, 28, while peace can be understood as a relatively modern idea, main quoted in Howard 2000, 1, however, the idea that peace is the norm dates back to antiquity, as Plato argues that matters of war should be legislated for the sake of peace, rather than the other way around, which was then taken up and reformulated by a range of thinkers including Aristotle, St. Augustine, and Grotius, Hughes 2022, pages 164 to 5. Within this conception, waging war is not an objective in itself but a means to eventually achieve a better peace among competing conceptualizations of war either as necessary, beneficial, or inevitable are, for example, the ideas of war as inescapable, Hughes 2022. Pages 128 to 9, Driver of Progress, Howard 2026, Bartleson 2018, pages 59 to 60, Cusa 2022, pages 75 to 80, Requirement for the Formation and Maintenance of Political Order, Giddens 1985, Tilly 1990, Legitimate Pastime, Rappoport 1982, 17, a noble or holy pursuit that is commanded by a divine entity, 
Rappoport 1982, 16, Husa 2022, pages 72 to 5. Despite the empirical ubiquity of war in history, efforts at replacing it with peaceful relations are multiple, and the lineages of thought conceptualizing war as a resolvable problem can be traced back to antiquity. These lineages of thought operate on different problem conceptions and, as a result, promote different possible mechanisms to resolve and prevent war. A key tradition of attempting to pacify relations between political and administrative entities, on a structural level, is the monopolization of the legitimate use of violence with a proto-state. While the concept was famously formulated by Max Weber 1919, in its legal sense, the idea can already be found in the writings of Jean Bowdoin and Thomas Hobbes. However, the practice of monopolizing legitimate violence can be traced back even further through the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms to the Pax et Truga Dei Peace and Truce of God of the Middle Ages and to Imperial Rome under Emperor Augustus, Giddens 1985, Bartelson 1995, Schilling 2007, Arthur de Ocono 2011, Husa 2019, 2022, by redefining acts of internecine war such as cattle rustling, factional conflicts, and other civil strife as criminal acts against the proto-state, Husa 2022, 90. The latter was then free to deploy its capacity for organized violence against other states and entities, Bartelson 2018, 33. Modern forms of international cooperation such as the Concert of Europe, the League of Nations, the UN, or the European Union can be understood as international applications of the idea to monopolize violence among a certain selection of powers or sovereign states within a given territory. Baumgart 1999, Urabi 2004, Arsid Okono 2011, Cusa 2019. Underlying the monopolization of legitimate violence as a way to quell war is the understanding that the latter is caused by behavioral patterns among states and state-like entities. In turn, if it is, proto, state behavior within a given world, order that makes a system prone to war, it follows that the problem of war can be resolved by devising a different order, such as through a balance of powers or by establishing different institutions, which facilitate a change in how entities interact with one another. Institutional attempts at resolving war include, for example, the prescription of war through international treaties, legal regulations of the legitimate use of force, the establishment of international arbitration systems, Arthur de Ocono 2011, Mozo 2013, Hathaway and Shapiro 2017, Bartelson 2018, Husa 2022 or the development of democracy and economic interdependence, also known as liberal pacifism or capitalist peace, Doyle 1986, Gartz 2007, Schneider and Gleditch 2010. However, neither the monopolization of violence, nor the balancing of powers as lineages of thought explains why current-day international policy agendas tend to represent war and violent conflict in formalized, measurable terms that appeal to scientific authority. In particular, the ubiquitous framing of war's cost-benefit ineffectiveness requires a different historicization and contextualization. The analysis I put forward in this article thus emphasizes how today's constitution of war as a problem is embedded in the broader development of modernity that is driven by the teleological idea that the human inherently strives for progress and can harness science and technology to achieve this goal. Allen 2018b, 135. Notwithstanding much older traditions of thought that attempted to resolve war at large, I elucidate here a specifically modern approach to pacification as civilization, Man 1988, Elias 2000, which appeals to the ideals of progress and the authority of science, as Allen 2018b, 80 and 3, shows a distinct shift in cosmological beliefs in Europe of the 16th to 19th centuries, not only underwrote discourses of the balance of power as world order, but also fostered the idea that events on Earth, including war, are subject to human intervention and control. The European political discourse prior to the 16th century was marked by the belief that the course of events is determined by divine providence or celestial forces. When war is necessary for maintaining order and generating progress, prevention is counterproductive. Prevention can only emerge as the ideal mode of governing war, 
when the latter is understood to be controllable through human interference. Thus, for contemporary prevention efforts to become possible, an understanding of war needed to arise that abandoned the idea of war as a force beyond human intervention for one in which war is controllable and avoidable. The introduction of concepts such as causes and effects through Newtonian mechanics paved the way for problem-centered reasoning and, ultimately, for a new humanist conception of the world in which events on Earth are governable by human intervention. Allen 2018 b. 22. In sum, several historical developments and mechanisms contributed to the broader notion that war can and should be prevented. These conceptions of war within the various lineages of thought, and its associated mechanisms for governing war, are not mutually exclusive. Indeed, they are often combined in peace advocacy and activism, and many protagonists of this article's narrative leveraged more than one of these strands to make the case for peace. For example, Andrew Carnegie was involved in establishing war as a scientific problem by funding the nascent peace science movement, while he also engaged in relations to set up mechanisms for resolving war through international arbitration. CCPDC 1997, G. Mazoa 2013, that is, rather than debating causal explanations for the notion of preventability, my claims here are principally constitutive as I argue that elucidating the role of science and expertise helps us understand how war was formulated as a problem that is accessible and resolvable through an international agenda of prevention policy. In the following three subsections, I trace how a range of non-state actors, from pacifists to philanthropists, scientists, and IOs, constituted war as an object of scientific interest, an object of expertise, and a governance object through the processes of designation, translation, and problematization. Pacifism, scientific philanthropy, and the designation of war during the 19th century, pacifist societies began to form in various countries, with the central objective to win the public for the cause of peace. Muller 1989, Lynch 1999, pages 43 to 4, Confortany 2012, Tipner and Tro 2018. This movement introduced a novel addition to war's set of characteristics, the designation of war as a scientific object, see also Andrew 2022, which was embedded within a larger development of epistemic modernism of Allen 2018b. With the development of mathematics and statistics, the view emerged that progress can be achieved by harnessing modern knowledge and technology Allen 2018b. 165. This sentiment also applied to international politics and relations among states, as embodied by the League of Nations. Its many organs of technocratic bureaucracy personified the idea of a world organized and controlled by scientific knowledge, thus marking the age of the scientific approach to international affairs. Morgan Thor 1947, 78, Allen 2018 b, 183, see also Mazoa 2013, Pages 141 to 53, grounded in the liberal convictions that the world is inherently rational and governed by reason, which means that systematic knowledge can not only identify but also eradicate the causes of war, a science of peace developed, Morgan Thor 1947, 70, full stop, as Morgan Thor, 1947, 86, argues, the scene to assist approach to international politics, which was central to 19th century liberal and Marxist thought and intensified after the First World War, replaced the craft of diplomacy and political skill with the search for the magic formula which, mechanically applied, will produce the desired result and thus substitute for the uncertainties and risks of political action, the certitude of rational calculation. He strongly rejects the notion that international affairs are reducible to problems of knowledge, governed by scientific standards, and characterizes the science of peace as a rationalist utopia that has destroyed the ability to make intelligent political decisions at all. Morgan for 1975, see also Malloy 2004, the industrialization and the ensuing economic boom after the First World War, created the economic conditions for the professionalization of this new science, as some of the newly rich industrialists felt compelled to return a portion of their wealth to society through scientific giving, Sealander 2003, 218, Weber 2014, 533.
Point to the steel magnate Andrew Carnegie played a central role in the consolidation of peace philanthropy through the establishment of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, CEIP, in 1910, Rosenberg 2003, 251. The CEIP's core task was to promote a thorough and scientific investigation and study of the causes of war and of the practical methods to prevent and avoid it, CEIP 1927. 6. In this way, the CEIP tapped into two sources of authority to not only define war as a scientific object, but an object of expertise. On the one hand, it appealed to the scientific method as a source of authority, Collins and Evans 2017. On the other hand, authority can also stem from group belonging, Litzkog and Sundquist 2018, which the CEIP achieved through pursuing the institutionalization and professionalization of the science for peace, motivated by the idea that an impartial examination by an independent authority, CEIP 1914, 3, would educate on the horrors of war and persuade the public of the imperative to prevent it. The CEIP set up the International Commission to inquire into the causes and conduct of the Balkan Wars. Its final report is one of the first examples of treating war as amenable to systematic investigation and direct observation, and war 2022. It contains a rich ethnographic narrative, photographs, maps, a statistical appendix, and what can be called an executive summary of the findings at the end of the document, CEIP 1914. Through the graphic description of its causes and effects, the report narrated war as destructive and devastating. The philanthropy for peace in the early 20th century was motivated by the belief that social and political problems could be improved through the same reordering processes as those that helped industries grow. The belief in science as the facilitator of progress and the conviction that humanity is by nature perfectible were informed by social Darwinist thought that inspired various influential thinkers at the time. Bell 2020, it thus fully embraced a modernist entrepreneurial spirit and combined it with a quasi-millenarian faith in the scientific approach to social problems that hoped to occur. E. Evils at their source. Sealander 2003. The underlying assumption of such efforts was that once its root causes are fully explored, war can be eradicated. Sealander 2003. 229. Weber 2014. 536. Different schools of thought identify a different scientific formula, S, for war's causation and remedy, from international organization to disarmament, legal frameworks, and various combinations thereof. Morgan Thor 1947, 90, reform era philanthropies such as the CEIP disciplined elected officials, to the need for experts both by collecting and disseminating abstract data as well as by seeding, founding, and funding organizations and institutions, Willoughby, Hera 2015, pages 13 to 4, that is, they presented problems that can be scientifically approached as ones that can be politically and administratively solved, thus creating deference to scientific expertise for governance, in the case of the CEIP specifically, making the scientific object war relevant to political interests was facilitated through the makeup of the organization, as its initial trustees included businessmen, civil servants, and politicians, including two former secretaries of state and three sitting or former ambassadors, as well as the former presidents of Harvard and Columbia University. Although efforts to solve the problem of war with science were undermined by the outbreak of the First World War, the tendency to approach political issues with scientific propositions intensified thereafter. As Morgan Thor, 1947-85, notes, the Hague Conferences, Hundreds of private peace congresses and governments themselves engaged in feverish activity, whose extent was unprecedented in all recorded history, with the purpose of solving all international problems through scientific methods. The escalation of war's destructive potential with the advent of the nuclear age gave rise to another wave of pacifism, this time led by researchers in the natural sciences. Physicists and nuclear scientists published manifestos that called for the peaceful use of atomic energy, and warned of the grave consequences of nuclear war, Salvia 2019. As perhaps the most famous one, the Einstein-Russell Manifesto included an explicit call to action in the form of an international conference of scientists on peace, 
and nuclear disarmament, which resulted in the Pudwash Conferences on Science and World Affairs. Like prior peace science initiatives, the Pudwash Conferences were also funded through philanthropy, specifically by the Canadian businessman and amateur scientist Cyrus Eaton. Salvia 2019, pages 54 to 6, from the 1950s onward, a blossoming of centres, journals, research projects, and training programs gave rise to what would soon be called peace or conflict research in the United States, Western Europe, Scandinavia, Japan, and India. Singer 1976. This emerging field of scholarship defined war as the central problem for the contemporary world. It rested on the fundamental conviction that war could be resolved, even prevented altogether, if it were thoroughly studied. Morgan Thor 1947, 86, Deutsch 1970, 473, Singer 1976, 120. This peace research movement mobilized resources from different disciplines for studying the conditions of war and peace. Kelman 1981, 95. Indeed, many of those beginning to research war in the 1950s and 1960s were not trained in, nor working in, IR but came from other fields such as psychology, economics, or mathematics. Kelman 1981. In 1997, when the fields of peace and conflict research had matured, the final report of the Carnegie Commission on Preventing Deadly Conflict, CCPDC 1997, here enough to call Carnegie Report, reaffirms the stance that war can be known through modern science. It argues that the scientific community is the closest approximation we now have to a truly international community. Due to its common set of interests, values, and standards, CCPDC 1997, 38, Invoking the Einstein-Russell Manifesto and the Pugwash Conferences as examples of scientific research and collaboration at the intersection with activism for peace, the report argues that the scientific community has the moral obligation to use its knowledge and tools toward the cause of preventing conflict. CCPDC 1997, 119. In other words, the Carnegie Report here clearly formulates scientific knowledge as relevant to the solution of the problem war. The underlying belief of the appeal to mobilize science for prevention subscribes to the paradigm of cause and effect, as it only makes sense to search for and try to understand the causes of things if one believes that they can be manipulated. In this way, the construction and institutionalization of war as an object of scientific expertise assumes war to be malleable, thus reaffirming a central condition for it to become a governance object. Corrie 2013, 87. In contrast to competing conceptions of war as productive and necessary or otherwise inevitable, the modern idea of war as a scientific phenomenon with causes and effects understands it as human-made and, as a consequence, as susceptible to influence and change. Prevention, in this way, becomes both a political and scientific challenge that involves understand, i, the nature and sources of human conflict, and above all, developing effective ways of resolving conflicts before they turn violent. CCPDC 1997, 118, the rise of statistics and the translation of war to become problems of international governance. Objects need to be translated across state contexts. Allen 2017, Pages 137 to 8, prevalent ways of abstracting war into a border-crossing phenomenon in contemporary policyholders are quantification and statistical modeling, which render war measurable, comparable, and ultimately malleable by remove, I, mm. elements of context to isolate specific properties. Allen 2017, 138, enumerating war in terms of military budgets, war debt, or fatality counts has immediate and indirect policy consequences as practitioners rely on these numbers as scientific evidence for policy design and evaluation, including peace-building operations, development programs, and advocacy campaigns. Roger Horno Act 2023, quantitative indicators of war, such as in the form of their human and material costs, abstracted into a comparative category. Abstraction works on the premise that there is an essence, a set of ideal typical characteristics of war that makes it possible to identify disparate events across time and space as belonging to the same category. That is, 
The representation of war as quantitative indicators translates and produces commensurability in that it creates equivalence across cases. See also Mary 2016. In the course of the writing reliance on science and the associated notion that it constitutes objective, rational, and thus authoritative inquiry, quantification became a central tool of modern thinking. Hawke Kemer and Adorno 2006, 33, from the 16th century onward, countries transformed into large territorial states and engaged in colonial and imperial conquest, measurement, aggregation, and calculation, as the cornerstones of making societies and their activities statistically legible, constitute a central component of modern governance, both in the service of crafting the nation, state and overseeing colonial expansion, Co. 1996, Scott 1998, Mitchell 2002, Foucault 2007, pages 67 to 79, Allen 2018 b. Statistical research was believed to unveil underlying laws of natural and societal progress, Mazoa 2013, 100, as briefly sketched above. Governance through abstraction is a distinctly provincial development associated with European modernity and its scientism. Against the background of governance through statistics, early attempts at quantifying war, and its effects developed at the intersection of peace activism, and the emergence of modern social science, Gledich, Nordsvel, and Strand 2014, 146. While the rise of conflict research as a distinct academic field dedicated to the systematic investigation of war is often pinpointed to the 1950s, early efforts at itemizing war can be traced back to the 19th century. Peace societies disseminated such research to the broader public and occasionally conducted studies on military expenditures and war fatalities. Weiberg 1984, 168. Most notably, the Massachusetts Peace Society, MPS, published reports that drew on various sources to itemize the size of major European past standing armies, the costs for their maintenance, and the lives lost to war, MPS 1818, 27. Noting that the losses are difficult to track, the first report of the Committee of Inquiry of the MPS presents a general estimate of 5,060,000 lives destroyed by a part of the wars of the civilized part of the world between 1800 and 1817 alone. Extrapolating from this number, the report then proceeds to tally all conflict deaths since the beginning of the world, and concludes that the enormous amount of 3,346 million sick of human beings sacrificed on the earth to the idol of war, MPS 1818, Pages 27 to 8, notwithstanding this somewhat fantastic calculation, the reports of the MPS nevertheless represent the beginnings of the realistic study of war. Courty 1973, 27, the tendency of the mathematization of the study of war manifests further in the 1867 Opus Contemporary Wars by the French economist Paul Leroy Bewley, which was first distributed in French by the Ligue Internationale de la Paix and republished in English by the London Peace Society. Here again, the statistical work on war is closely related to colonial interests. A minty of Adam Smith, Leroy Bewley was not only a central thinker of public administration in France, but also a staunch believer in Darwinian selection, who held that civilized nations have the right to intervene in uncivilized ones to induce societal progress. Leroy Bewley 1874, Jimmy 1992. Contemporary Wars sets out to catalogue the losses, both of money and men, resulting from war, although the study claims to cover the great wars which have afflicted mankind during the mid-19th century. It only compiles data concerning European interstate wars and the American Civil War. Imperial wars such as those by the French are separated from war as distant expeditions. Leroy Bewley, 1869, 1. Contemporary Wars provides tables that register deaths resulting from battle, wounding, disease, or suicide during war, as well as military expenditures for navies and armies Leroy Bewley 1869, Jimmy 1992, 346. This compilation of numbers and tables not only allows for comparing the effects of war among different countries and times. In addition, Leroy Bewley concludes, 1869, 56, by making a cumulative argument against war, 
In the space of 14 years between 1853 and 1866, a total of about 1,750,000 men was swept off by war from civilized nations, which he compares to the whole male population of Holland at the time. The peace philanthropy of the early 20th century continues and deepens the trend of rendering war knowable through scientific investigation, such as through the aforementioned report by the Balkan Commission at the CEIP, 1914, which compiled both qualitative and quantitative evidence to document the effects and costs of war. After the two world wars, quantitative scholarship on war experienced an upsurge, especially at U.S. universities. The studies by Peter M. Sorokin, Quincy Wright, and Lewis Richardson are often cited as the founding works of contemporary conflict research to which 1970, 474, Singer 1976, 119, Kelman 1981, 95, Geller 2004, 222, Wright's Study of War, 1942, which was also supported by funding from philanthropic organizations such as the Carnegie Corporation and the Rockefeller Foundation. Zaidi 2017, 417, compiles an enormous amount of data in 44 appendices with tables, graphs, and maps to control, and eventually prevent war. In Wright's conception, war is squarely a measurable and translatable phenomenon, from data such as the yield of bombs, the amount of energy supply, public opinion polls, or the number of international treaties and organizations. Inferences could be drawn to estimate the speed and scope of processes increasing or decreasing the likelihood of uncontrolled large-scale conflicts, and hence the size and power of the forces of making war and peace, to which 1970, 475, however, writes, 1942, pages 39 to 40, concern is primarily with a certain type of modern and industrialized war, as his conception subscribes to the modernist dichotomy that divides the world into civilized, that is, capitalist liberal democracies, and primitive societies, each with their associated types of warfare. In contrast, civil and colonial strife does not fall within this definition of modern war. As Saidi, 2018, 422, notes, Wright's demarcation of warfare was informed by his internationalist sympathies and his commitment to outlawing war, albeit only where it was not supported by the so-called family of nations, while conflict sanctioned as international policing action would be allowed to persist. Formal modeling and inferential statistical analyses of war, now commonplace in conflict research, were pioneered by Lewis Richardson for example, 1945-1960. His study, Statistics of Deadly Quarrels, is an ambitious project that attempts to record all deaths between 1820 and 1950 caused by a deliberate act of another human. His work provides a dramatic illustration of the ways in which the methods of the physical and biological sciences may be applied to problems in the social sciences. Singer 1976, 119, Weiberg 1984, 169. However, although Richardson's methodology was novel for the study of war, it can be seen as a part of a wider trend at the time toward the methematization of whole areas of knowledge. Nicholson, 1999, pages 555 to 6. Leroy Bewley's Contemporary Wars writes a study of war. All Richardson's statistics of deadly quarrels can be considered early instances of database building to record violence data that see their successors in today's conflict databases, like the Correlates of War, COW, Project the Armed Conflict Location and Event Data Project, ACLED, or the Uppsala Conflict Data Program, UCDP. What unites these efforts at cataloging war is the shared motivation to enumerate, classify, and categorize instances of wars across time and space, to provide numerical data that enable testing causal models to uncover linkages and explain variation in outcomes, and, ultimately, to produce policy relevant and actionable knowledge that can be leveraged toward developing policies to mitigate, and ideally prevent, the adverse war and its consequences. Cross 2017, 94. The designation of war as an epistemic object that can be categorized and measured, and its translation into comparable indicators, made possible a new form of expertise around war that rested on the modernist idea that social and political problems, 
can be resolved by harnessing science and technology. The aggregation of distinctive and historically specific events makes them commensurable and transforms war into a problem of international governance best responded to with an international agenda, conflict prevention. At the same time, such numbers convey war's scale, severity, and urgency. See also Roger Horno Act 2023. That is, translation via quantification not only produces war as a scientific object by translating it into a commensurable and portable concept, but also makes it accessible and relevant to international policy as an object of expertise. It does so by creating knowledge objects. Esquera 2024, this forum, in the form of enumerating observable manifestations and effects of war such as the size of navies, the number of war dead, or the yield of bombs, and aggregating them into abstract and comparable indicators, costs benefit rationality, development, and the problematization of war, the third element of problem constitution is to latch the object onto existing discourses of threats, identities, interests, and policy frames. This process of problematization determines the target audiences and defines the type of problem it poses for the former Allen 2017, 138. Target audiences need to be convinced that it is not only possible, but also desirable to govern the problem and thus warrant their attention and resources. The rise of statistics as a tool for governing socio-political issues facilitated the constitution of war as an object of expertise that can be known and represented in numerical terms. Such enumeration, in turn, makes it possible to aggregate and compare war across contexts, thus rendering it a genuinely global problem. In direct juxtaposition to the notion of war as beneficial and profitable, Peace advocates leveraged statistics to characterize it as a waste of valuable resources. The tabulation of the expenses and losses of war made possible the argument that it is, too, costly, as numbers, tables, and graphs make visible how war's costs outweigh its gains. Notably, versions of the idea that war was economically counterproductive existed for some time before 19th century. Pacifists leveraged it anew. For example, Kant cited in Muller 1989, 27, already argues in the late 18th century that the spirit of commerce is irreconcilable with war. Similarly, British politicians Richard Cobden and John Bright posited in the 19th century that free trade is only possible against a background of peace. Muller 1989, 27, the central argument for governing war is thus that it is cost ineffective, whereas preventing it is cost effective. This concerns material and financial costs arising from expenses for armament and military, the mitigation of political and economic instability, the management of refugee flows, humanitarian and peacekeeping operations, as well as post-conflict reconstruction, Brown and Rosecrans 1999. The losses incurred by war, as emphasized by peace advocates, also concern immaterial, not readily quantifiable, or even counterfactual aspects such as lives and opportunities lost due to death and injury, the disruption of welfare and education, and the progress of developmental goals. CCPDC 1997, 20, and 2001, 7. Consequently, prevention advocates frequently emphasize that not incurring those costs by avoiding wars is the optimal policy option. The cost-benefit argument thus firmly rejects the competing conception of war as a historical necessity for progress and order. The rise of rationalization and efficiency over the 19th century made the costliness of war a pressing issue. Alexander 2008, Allen 2018 b. 89, pacifist writings of that time increasingly included accounts of war financing, which detailed military salaries, costs for armament, and the resulting national debt. The aforementioned first report of the Committee of Inquiry of the MPS, 1818, is one of the earliest examples of the data-driven approach to the argument against war. It presents specific amounts of expenses for armies, navies, and ordnance as well as commissariats and barracks incurred by the British, Austrian, and U.S. governments, presenting evidence of the increase of state debt, it claims that war is the single most important cause for government's budgetary problems. Although the first report makes no direct comparison to peacetime budgets, 
The second report of the Committee of Inquiry implies that the expenses incurred for military purposes in a given period were larger than those dedicated to civil areas of society, including the government, religion, literature, and charity. MPS 1818-27. It thus leverages the counterfactual argument that the resources spent for war could have been used for other efforts with greater returns and societal value. 40 26 Counterfactual claims about how countries and societies would have prospered if their budgets had been put toward civil purposes rather than war are a recurring theme in proto-scientific studies of war. A similar statement features in Leroy Bewley's 1869, pages 56 to 7 Contemporary Wars. He calculates that a total of £1,193 million sterling has been consumed by recent wars, which, if employed in works of peace, would have entirely transformed the social and financial condition of civilized nations within the same period. Emphasis original. In the same vein, the core argument of the study is war now impossible, by the Polish businessman and economist Ivan Bloch, is that any gains of victory would never exceed the material losses due to war. Answering the eponymous question in the affirmative, Bloch, 1899, argues that the associated costs and destruction make war economically untenable, thus rendering any victory pyrrhic. Prominent economists at the time, such as Norman Angel, 2007, 1910, see also Wright 1942, 260, Muller 1989, 27, supported and reinforced Bloch's argument. While Angel's theories were not uncontested, Muller, 1989, 28, argues that he helped to crystallize a line of reasoning that has become increasingly accepted, so that contemporary critics are to concede that war is unprofitable in itself and belligerent conflict between two great nations, injures both Maya 1912, in its effort to approach the abolition of war by publicizing scientific studies, the CEIP, 1914, 235, also explicitly rejects the notion of war's profitability by presenting evidence of its economic ramifications. The Balkan Commission's report is prefaced by a preemptive rebuttal to various objections that the public at the time of its publication might have against its findings, including the argument that war is of moral benefit because it exalts heroism, and of material profit because it increases several important industries, and might even nourish the population, three bracketing wars of defense and liberation. The commissioners reject this position as sophism and argue that in real war, such as a state undertakes in order to extend its possessions, or to assert its strength to the detriment of another country, both the victor and the defeated lose in moral and material terms. CEIP 1914, 4 and 5, advancing the claim that war is the destruction of wealth. The report notes that this concerns not only the material destruction of land, infrastructure, weaponry, and ammunition, but also the disruption of financial flows and the reduction of reserves. It also already broaches the subject of what current-day economists would call human capital. Here again, the counterfactual notion that if it were not for war, societies would prosper, resonates as the report laments that the young, the strongest, who were yesterday the strength of their country, who were its future of fruitful labor, are laid low by shot and shell, CEIP 1914, 235, that is, war diminishes future opportunities as current and potential workers die on the battlefield, the claim of war's cost in effectiveness that pacifist studies established in the 19th and early 20th centuries, reverberates in the contemporary prevention agenda after 1990. While the Carnegie Report acknowledges that preventing war also requires financial resources as action entails costs, and costs demand trade orfs, these are minuscule when compared with the costs of deadly conflict, CCPDC 1997, 46, the latter not only concern the direct expenses of waging war, but also those incurred in its aftermath, such as reduced economic growth, minimized trade and investment opportunities, and the added costs of reconstruction, UN, and World Bank 2018, 25. The cost-benefit argument for prevention targets different audiences at different points in time. The pacifists of the 19th and early 20th centuries defined war as a fiscal problem for state governments by pointing to war debts, various expenses, 
and the effects on national economies. From the middle of the 20th century, IOs picked up the cost-benefit argumentation for preventing war against the background of modernist ideas of growth and underdevelopment, Frank 1986, Escobar 2001, Estiva 2019, Rodney 2018. In light of a growing preoccupation with the pervasiveness of violent conflict in the global south, Neoclassical explanations that saw the primary factors contributing to armed violence as economic inequality, poverty, and resource competition increasingly defined the conflict analyses of the World Bank in the 2000s. Kramer 2006, 2. That is, the problem of war shifted away from the threat of nuclear confrontation, and instead became interdependent with the problem of development, so that the UN and the World Bank increasingly attached the problem of war and its cost. Ineffectiveness to the development agenda, for example, Boutros Ghali 1992, 18, and 2001, 25, UN and World Bank 2018, 1. Here, war as a hindrance to progress and growth turns into a governance problem for those invested in economic development. Consequently, every step taken towards reducing poverty and achieving broad based economic growth is a step towards conflict prevention and in 2045, peace and economic development become two sides of the same coin, with war and underdevelopment as their negative counterparts. A resolution passed by the UN General Assembly in 2003, UNGA 2003, 2, also entitled Prevention of Armed Conflict and in direct reference to the Secretary General's report, reaffirms this by recognizing that peace and development are mutually reinforcing including in the prevention of armed conflict. The problematization of war as a governance object through latching it onto the development agenda continues in the agenda setting and programming of IOs in the last decade, as development policy identifies war and violent conflict as major hindrances to reaching development goals, for example, World Bank 2011, UN 2015, 9, UN and World Bank 2018, this consolidation of the agendas of development and prevention takes place against the background of a continued and even intensified appeal to evidence-based policyholders and the appeal to the authority of science, as IOs increasingly rely on in-house research institutes and external consultancy to compile global reports that contain a large amount of statistical data and visualization, ZAP 2022, 460. In this way, normative statements such as regarding the moral benefit of prevention, are now always buttressed with the armory of science, ZAP 2022, 469, leveraging cost-benefit rationality and the counterfactual claim already present in early peace advocacy. The Pathways for Peace report argues that violent conflict reverses hard-won development gains, stunts the opportunities of children and young people, and robs economies of opportunities for growth. UN and World Bank 2018, 11, it reaffirms that violent conflict is an impediment to development and prosperity today and in the future, while preventing it is cost-effective, saves lives, and safeguards development gains, UN and World Bank 2018, 18, see also UN 2015, 9, in this understanding, prevention minimizes the costs of destruction generated by cycles of violence, thus making it a rational and cost-effective strategy for countries at risk of violence, and for the international community, UN, and World Bank 2018, too. Even more recently, the report are common agenda by the current UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres 2021, 60, reaffirms the cost-effectiveness notion by stating that, I, Investments in prevention and preparedness pay for themselves many times over in the human and financial costs that are spared. Preventing war becomes thus not only morally but also rationally justified, as the costs of war and post-war reconstruction are claimed to far outweigh the costs of prevention. Boutros Ghali 1992, CCPDC 1997, UN 2000, BAN 2011, UN and World Bank 2018, as UN Secretary General Kofi Annan 2001, 8, puts it, M, all effective prevention strategies, would save not only hundreds of thousands of lives, but also billions of dollars, then again, 
Such pithy statements that establish prevention as the most preferable policy choice are made possible by the underlying conception of war as a scientifically knowable and measurable object, as well as through the authority borne by scientific evidence and measurement. Conclusion This article started with the observation that, contrary to the notion of war as profitable or necessary, a particular conception of war, namely, that it can and should be prevented, is prevalent with IOs, development actors, and other intergovernmental and non-governmental bodies today, to examine how this conception was entrenched within the international sphere. I traced how war became constituted as a problem of science, expertise, and eventually, evidence-based governance, building on recent work adopting an object-centered approach to IR. I showed how the working principle of the contemporary prevention agenda, that war is an object that can be governed by knowing it through science, was established. Leveraging archival and current-day texts, I argued that the process of constituting war as a calculable problem amenable to scientific investigation and evidence-based governance was aided by the formalization of the study of war, a heterogeneous group of actors comprising peace advocates, public figures, and scholars constructed war as a governance problem that can be addressed by international governance against the backdrop of a modernist worldview, in which scientific knowledge can be harnessed to manage and resolve social and political problems. Using Allen's, 2017, theoretical framework of problem constitution as an analytical and structuring device, I argued that war's construction as a problem of international evidence-based governance unfolded in three interrelated processes. Firstly, peace advocates designated war as an epistemic object that can be represented through empirical evidence and scientific investigation. The modernist idea that scientific knowledge makes problems calculable, predictable, and thus ultimately governable helped establish a philanthropy-funded peace science, which was driven by the motivation that if only war's causes and effects were sufficiently known, it could be averted altogether. This motivation was embedded in broader liberal aspirations toward the world governed by progress and reason. Secondly, scholars and pacifists represented war as numbers and statistics, thus translating it across contexts by conveying that war is a global phenomenon, even if it presents differently across time and space. Such metrics also bolstered the argument that war is unprofitable, especially by putting its costs in comparable or counterfactual terms. The statistical representation of war not only reinforces its designation as an object of scientific inquiry, but also makes it accessible to advocacy and policyholders, thus turning it into an object of expertise. However, the primary concern was markedly Eurocentric. War, in the conception of the fledgling peace science movement, refers exclusively to interstate strife among those on the higher rungs of the imagined civilizational ladder, while imperial conquest was not initially part of this problem conception, totally against the backdrop of colonial expansion and the ideal of progress, peace advocates problematized war as a governance object by deeming it a fiscal problem of unprofitability that comes with exorbitant costs through this economic lens. War became understood as reversing development outcomes in the discourse of IOs in the 20th century, thus undermining the notion of war as a driver of progress. However, these three processes of object construction are neither once-off occurrences, nor do they necessarily take place. Consecutively Allen 2017, 139, see also Bulger and Stockbroker 2024, this issue. Instead, as I showed above, Designation, translation, and problematization can be combined within the same texts. Conflict prevention thus emerges as the ideal type of governing war against the backdrop of scientific developments of European modernity. In this article, I argued that the idea of prevention and its underlying understanding of war is grounded in the modernist legacy of the Enlightenment, its telos of progress, and its deference to science as authoritative knowledge. However, this is not to imply that the contemporary prevention discourse and policy are problematic, neo-colonial, or otherwise wrong, nor does it prove the opposite. Instead, it is precisely because war continues to be a problem in international agenda setting and policyholders, that it is important to ask how exactly it is so. And draw 2022, 723, emphasis original. While I focused on the development of its conception as a knowable and measurable object, 
Other aspects of this problem formulation of war require further research. Aside from cost-benefit arguments, deontological moral reasoning, according to which war needs to be prevented because it violates rules and principles, and is thus inherently undesirable, is also prominent in pacifists' advocacy. Numerous peace philanthropists of the pre-war and interwar years subscribe to white supremacist theories of evolution, and one of the central themes of pacifist writing at the time was the denunciation of war as a barbaric and thus inappropriate means of conflict resolution. For those who deemed themselves civilized, the telos of progress allowed Anglo-American internationalists to justify their own country's imperialism in the name of a civilizing mission of spreading liberalism and democracy to backward peoples. Lynch 1999, 51. Future research could explore the role of colonial tropes and evolutionist thinking that ties war to barbarism in its constitution, as a problem of governance in more detail, and how they reverberate in the assumptions and framings of current prevention policy. Relatedly, as time passes and it becomes more politically salient, governance objects are exposed to contention Allen 2017, 139. They thus have to be continually reconstituted and stabilized. Notably, the conception of war as undesirable but measurable and preventable exists despite conceptual and empirical tensions with the practice of accepting war in the form of military interventions. Finnamore 2003, thus making it possible to render wars objectionable in one policy agenda and wage them in other contexts. Further research could draw out how the boundaries of the governance problem war rely on delineating it from the use of force in the form of colonial expansion, revolutionary and decolonizing struggles, or humanitarian intervention within scientific pacifist thought. To conclude, this origin story of today's international conception of war, and the necessity of preventing it shows that it is distinctly provincial rather than universal. Indeed, this analysis of war's constitution as an object of international governance showed that those who seek to prevent war are enrolled in the constitution and reconstitution of the very problem they intend to address. The notion of a scientifically knowable and measurable object provides a frame for knowing war in that it draws the boundaries around what it is and what it is not. This constitutive process makes possible certain ways of action, while foreclosing others as it conveys an implicit policy prescription, namely that the problem of war needs to be prevented from occurring in the first place. Where international reports, analyses, and policy briefs employ such discursive frames, they convey a set of unspoken assumptions about the object of war that then enable a range of scientific and political interventions for the sake of averting war's undesirable consequences. Acknowledgement the author thanks Kirsten Ainley, Bentley Allen, Christine Andraw, Emil Archambault, Tarek Barkoy, Christian Buja, Alejandro Esquera, Johnny Hall, Kimberly Hutchings, Millie Lake, Kayla Pomeroy, Earl Jacob Sending, two anonymous reviewers, and the editors of the Global Studies Quarterly for their helpful comments at various stages of the project. This article draws on research conducted as part of the author's doctoral studies, which were funded by the UK Economic and Social Research Council, ESRC, and the London School of Economics of Political Science. It was revised during the author's postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Pennsylvania's Perry World House, and finalized during the postdoctoral fellowship at Stanford University's Center for International Security and Cooperation. Earlier versions of this article were presented at the British International Studies Association Virtual Panel Ethics in Conflict and Conflict Prevention in November 2020, and at the Virtual Panel Object oriented approaches to international governance at the annual meeting of the International Studies Association in March, 2022. Copyright the author, S. 2024. Published by Oxford University Press on behalf of the International Studies Association. This is an open access article distributed under the terms of the Creative Commons Attribution License HTTPS colon slash slash creativeacommons.org slash licenses slash by slash four dot zero slash which permits unrestricted reuse distribution and reproduction in any medium provided the original work is properly cited joanna roger pacifism the science of peace and the constitution of war as a governance problem global studies quarterly volume four issue three july 2024
C057 https colon slash slash doi dot org slash one zero dot one zero nine three slash shy q slash kc zero five seven